After the 2017 general election, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party seemingly stood on the brink of power. From nowhere, they had enjoyed the biggest increase in vote share of any party since 1945, some 10%. And in England, they'd gone toe-to-toe with the Tories for the first time since 1997. Inevitable crushing defeat had become something else, with the party depriving the Tories of their majority and being just a handful of seats away from being able to lead a government. But from there, it was a story of Glastonbury to catastrophe. And last December, Labour weren't merely defeated, but gained their lowest number of seats since 1935. A remarkable experiment with a radical socialist leading the party for the first time in almost a century had ended in calamity. But how did this happen? How did so much change and so quickly? Who bears the most responsibility? And could it have been any different? With me today to discuss all of that and more are Gabriel Pogren and Patrick Maguire, authors of Left Out, the inside story of Labour under Corbyn. Gabriel, Patrick, thank you for joining us and welcome to Navarra Media. Hello. Thank you. Uh, before we get on to the, the, the really substantive content of the book, and there's a lot there, it's, it's a big book, but I don't think that should put anybody off from reading it. It's thoroughly enjoyable. When did you decide to write the book? Because you've obviously delivered a manuscript incredibly quickly. Well, we uh, had been sort of kicking this idea around for a while. I mean, the truthful answer is Tim Shipman insisted we, we do it. He, uh, uh, the you know, Tim, Political Legends of the Sunday Times, uh, you know, wrote, uh, I guess, the last tranche of instant political history, first draft of history books about Brexit and the Ruxians in the Conservative Party. Um, and Tim was insistent that somebody had to write a book on Labour uh, in this period uh, because of the similarly, um, you know, unprecedented uh, nature of the democratic experiment that happened in the Labour Party, right? You know, Brexit was completely without precedent, uh, as was, as you say, if you accept George Lansbury, uh, a, a figure from the radical left leading the Labour Party. So Tim basically said, uh, you know, you two must write this book. He basically probably shamed us into doing it. Um, and uh, by by January, we were we had a sort of proposal and idea set in train. But obviously, the idea crystallised after the um, after the after the election, because obviously somebody had to tell that story, and the nature of the defeat was as such that it was going to be incredibly contested. That narrative, um, and people from within the movement were going to tell their own stories, as we're already seeing, um, and we wanted to be the people, I think, to tell it from the outside in. That's good to hear. Uh, we're going to start with 2017, which is where the book starts from. There's there's not that much of the kind of euphoric period of Corbynism, but I don't think necessarily that's of the most interest to, to people in the, in the present context. I'll, I'll ask a very simple question. What was going on at Ergon House during the election period of 2017? It's been hotly contested. Uh, but is it fair to say there was a, a campaign uh, targeting various seats, trying to resource certain parliamentary seats, which the Labour leadership at that time was not aware of? That is, that's correct. Um, there was there are a number of officials at Labour headquarters on Southside, that's the party's headquarters in uh, Victoria slash Westminster, um, who believe that Labour and the Parliamentary Labour Party would be reduced to a rump uh, after the 2017 general election. Um, they saw imminent catastrophe. And what they say now um, is that in order to preserve some good MPs to help rebuild the party after defeat, they funneled resources um, to certain constituencies um, across the UK. Um, somebody told us that you know it, it wasn't necessarily the sexiest parallel campaign you ever heard of. They principally distributed leaflets, um, which contained a message, I believe, which had been drafted by Margaret McDonough, uh, the Labour peer, which uh, said something to the effect of, we know that you, the voters, despise Corbyn. Um, don't worry, we hate him just as much. Um, please re-elect us so that we can rebuild uh, the party from whatever is left. And um, obviously the kind of leaked report pro provided some amazingly rich documentary evidence of this. Uh, we also established during the course of our reporting that there was a WhatsApp group um, within the kind of Ergen House uh, parallel campaign, Ergen House being the party's London regional headquarters. Um, the, the WhatsApp group they had was called the Deck Chair Realignment Society. So quite a vivid metaphor, basically alluding to the fact that Labour was the Titanic. Uh, it, was, it was sinking. Um, Armageddon was inevitable and 
they were kind of uh, they, they, they were joking. They were merely uh, realigning the, the deck chairs uh, as as the as the ship sank. Um, but no, to, to oh, yeah, your question, was the he was a captain. Yes, um, I think that I think in fact there's now a group of Southside alumni called um, what's that group called? R.I.P. the Captain. Um, I don't know if I, 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 don't, I don't know how so popular is that captain? is. Ian, Ian McNichol. McNichol. Ian McNichol. But so, so I mean, so you, you've spoken to a range of people. They principally maintain that this was a well-intentioned effort to, to save as many seats as possible. You've alluded there to the uh, the leaked Labour report, which contains various WhatsApp messages and so on. And, and within that leaked report, some of the people who were um, running this um, this counter campaign, effectively, within that report, they are angered, upset, concerned, or mocking any polling over the course of the election campaign which suggested Labour were doing well. Do, do you think there's a, there seems to be a bit of a dissonance there to say, well, on the one hand, we were panicking that the party was going to tank. It was a last minute effort to save as many MPs as possible. And yet we know at the same time they were saying, oh, this YouGov poll or this opinion poll showing Labour on 35, 36, 37, that can't possibly be right. And then talking up every poll which Labour performs badly. And I mean, that, that doesn't quite make sense. It doesn't quite tally with what they're now saying. Uh, regarding their intentions at the time. Well, to answer, to answer your first question, I think the the intention was definitely, as Gabriel says, to save as many MPs as they could. But the, you know, their MPs who they would deem to be sound. For instance, you know, you're looking at Rachel Reeves, Yvette Cooper, Tom Watson. You know, I don't think um, I, I might be wrong, but I am you know 99% sure that they're, they're, they weren't devoting resources to say Cat Smith in uh, Lancaster and Fleetwood, whose seat was then very marginal. For instance. Um, and yeah, and the interesting, but the interesting question about you ask about polling um, is that there was always polling during that came, campaign to satisfy the narrative that Labour weren't going to Labour might have done better than the um, you know say that Len McCluskey was talking about two hundred seats quite early in that campaign. Um, but you know, I think I can't remember what exactly Patrick Hennigan's final poll said uh, or the poll you know he briefed to uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Seamus Mill on that line, but it was still some distance off a off a hung Parliament. Um, but yeah, as you say, you know, there was there was an expectation that Labour weren't going to do very well and that Southside saw it as their duty to salvage a PLP that they could do business with or that they, they could feel could do business with the with the public and make as a, a definitive a breach from Corbynism as possible. The book itself sort of uh, hinges around big characters. I mean, that's that's pretty obvious, I think. You know, you, you tell the story, um, and it's not the story of policy, it's not the story of of movements. You know, there's, there's no mention, for instance, of the climate change, the Green New Deal. I mean, that's not the intention of the book. Uh, it's about, you know, various people at the top of this movement slash organisation, because ultimately we're dealing with electoral politics. They want to run, the, you know, administer the British state. Uh, and the big characters are uh, John McDonnell, Carrie Murphy, and, and, and of course, Jeremy Corbyn in his own way. To a less extent, Seamus Mill. But I think the most sort of pathetic, and all of them actually, you know, at moments you sort of respect them, admire them. At other times you go, no, nah, you shouldn't have done that. But the one I think who comes up almost uniquely sort of pathetic is Ian McNichol. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some nice little sort of vignettes you offer. So one being, you know, he, he, something breaks in his office uh, where he has like a peak of anger and somebody's cleaning it up after him and he's sort of musing around his future in the Labour Party and, and so on. I mean, is it fair to say that somebody like Ian McNichol was, I mean, I, I, to what extent did he reflect a Labour Party that was utterly dysfunctional? Because clearly, on the one hand, people are saying, well, the Labour Party was dysfunctional under Jeremy Corbyn. But if you've got people behaving in the way they were at Ergon House, that's one thing, right? Because they say we're trying to save something from itself. But I think when you've got Ian McNichol as General Secretary, I mean, that suggests something else, doesn't it? It suggests that you did have a sediment of people at the top of the Labour Party who really viewed themselves as acting autonomously with impunity from the rest of the organisation and, and didn't really care about the consequences. I mean, is that an accurate way of looking at some of the people around the, you know, the, the deck chair realignment society and various allies of Ian Michael? I think that um, for decades, the role of General Secretary, um, you sort of, a union has its turn every few years and um, it's typically a quite managerial, bureaucratic role. You allocate funding, you oversee election campaigns. Um, I don't like using the word unprecedented because we tried to be scholars of the last half decade. I don't know whether this applied to, say, the party under 
Ramsey McDonald uh, or or whoever. But um, I think that it is rare that you have this incredible and quite violent gulf between the general secretary and then the leadership of the party. So Ian McNichol was not a figure who rose to office expecting to become the kind of physical incarnation of the resistance. And, um, you know, whether he was equipped to do that, I mean, th- there are people on his own team who uh, who didn't have faith in him. Um, there are other people who say he did what he could uh, within the context of uh, in a, in a, in an impossible situation. I will also say to his credit that um, somebody from Corbyn's team who was there on election night said that he looked pleasantly surprised by the 2017 result, which couldn't be couldn't be said for a lot of other people whose faces were were sallow and um, and, and mournful. Um, but but to answer your question, I mean, uh, was he emblematic of a kind of wider institutional dysfunction? Um, it, it was self evident, and he knew this himself on election night that once Corbyn Easters had won the right to run the party, um, once there was no doubt that Corbyn himself was unassailable after 2016, and then that was compounded in 2017, um, he, he was always going to have to go. And the interesting, the interesting thing about Ian McNichol is that he's actually quite a unifying figure, um, which may sound like a weird thing to, to hear said about Ian McNichol, particularly um, on Navarra Media, on Navarra Media podcast. But the thing is that I, I got a message from a former... Um, a former Shadow Cabinet advisor last week, and they said the key to understanding the Labour Party, particularly in the first years of Corbyn's leadership, is the extent to which everybody on every wing of the party, uh, for better or worse, thought Ian McNichol was varying degrees of useless. Um, now, obviously, he has uh, a small coterie of staunch defenders who will say that's an utterly unfair characterisation, um, but I'd say there's a critical mass of people who were in the Labour Party in that period who didn't think Ian McNichol was up to the job. So this, this characterisation of Ian McNichol as a sort of wrecker, as the face of, um, you know, a South side that was determined to resist and didn't see Corbyn's leadership as legitimate, um, isn't strictly accurate, but not not necessarily because Ian McNichol was conciliatory or wanted to get on board. It's because a lot of people in South side look to other people for their de facto leadership. Um, and actually, you know, a key, a key to understanding why South side was so dysfunctional in this period is because different people saw... Uh, different leaders, leadership figures um, in coordinating the resistance to, to Corbynism as they saw it. Is it true that when he, um, when he went for the job of General Secretary, what was it, in 2010, um, he, he basically did a A3 kind of mood board of what the Labour should do. It was with highlighters and felt tips and biros. And is, is that rather than a PowerPoint presentation? I don't recall if that was written in the Sunday Times or by yourself. No, I, I, I did get leaked that a while ago. Um, that was his. Um, it's just an utterly, I mean, it just suggests an utterly amateurish approach. You know, this was the organisation into which Jeremy Corbyn was, whether or not he became the leader in 2010, it, it does seem like the organisation was just a, you know, not really yeah, I mean, I, at the top of its game when it comes to kind of organisational um, organizational functions. That, that, that might be right. And I, I also think that um, one feature of the Corbyn years was the extreme politicisation of bureaucracy so um you know there, there's this moment we recount in the book where tim waters who was uh labor's head of data um, mourned the fact that you know people used to people used to report on these meetings he said with reference to the nec um but over the blair years over new labor the kind of organs of party of the party had become ossified and they were deliberately depoliticized by the party leadership um, whereas if you want to understand the Corbyn years, you know, suddenly now you need to understand what the governance and legal unit was, what the, never mind the NEC, you need to know what the NCC was. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, naturally as these bodies were politicized, um, you, you kind of, the, the scrutiny on whether they were there to, you know, be quasi judicial bodies or yeah. rather to facilitate the fixing of union bureaucrats, um, was, was thrown into, into harsher and sharper relief. Um, it's interesting you said that. I remember having a conversation with somebody in the leader's office, and I said, "You're going to need you're going to need a press conference at the NEC because there's so much political risk around it." I mean, that would be any new organisation where there was that level of political risk attached to a, a body, they would have their own press officer, and people are like that's absurd, that's ridiculous. I mean, in normal times, it would have been. Yeah, they did because you know at the end there were sort of twenty press officers for the NEC in that 
every member of the NEC and every persuasion was <laughs> you know, frequently what's had a WhatsApp broadcast, li- broadcast list without betraying any sources or indeed how exactly they chose to disseminate particular quotes from particular NEC meetings. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And as Gabriel says, you know, uh, suddenly, and it wasn't just the left and Corbyn's leadership had to learn to get to grips with this machinery of power. The right had to relearn how to fight a rear guard. And if you think about it, in the past, say, 25 years, who are the only who are the only people in the on the right of the Labour Party who've been fighting a rear guard? John Speller. I mean, the list is maybe about as long as John Speller, who, you know, um, in terms of party, in terms of party civil war is like that sort of Japanese POW who um, at some point in the 1980s um, got lost in the sort of rainforest of Labour's internal bureaucracy. Um, but yeah, you know, it's sort of it, everybody had to learn how to acclimatise to this new reality. And I think our conclusion is nobody really did. How big, how big a moment do you think, I mean, and we may disagree about this, or, or maybe we, we dis, we have, we've probably come to the same conclusion for different reasons. Um, how, how big a moment was the Salisbury incident in terms of uh, a recalibration again in, in terms of um, Corbyn's perception by the media, by his own MPs? Because you, you, you identify it as a, as a singular, everybody obviously has, but as a, as a really significant singular moment in this passage from Glastonbury to catastrophe. Um, I mean, look, we're, we're, we're not sophologists, and whether it's merely, whether Salisbury has any causation as, you know, I mean, people say Salisbury was a high watermark, and then beyond that point, Corbyn's poll ratings declined. Um, I don't know whether that's correlation or causation. I don't know, um, you, you, you know, as you say, we've written a deliberately SW1-centric book. Um, we, we've not, you know, paid much recourse to focus groups or voters in understanding um, how how that moment went down in the country. Um, but I think one thing that is clear is that, number one, um, sort of peace did break out momentarily after the 2017 uh, general election, and Salisbury was a definitive moment at which certain hawks and other members of the PLP decided um, we, we cannot just pretend the status quo can hold. Um, and also, uh, I, think it, I think we feel like it's a moment where um, some of the divides between um, Corbyn and McDonald's offices um, you know, w- w- widen as well. Um, there's this quote which we, um, which we thought was particularly poignant where, with respect to anti-Semitism, which I'm sure we'll come on to, um, somebody said that John McDonald would have had Jeremy on the next plane to Jerusalem um, if it had been um, up to him. Um, whereas, uh, you know, naturally Corbyn and a lot of the people around him were more disposed towards, um, you know, keeping a principled position and, and, and not kind of caving to perceived media or PLP pressure. Um, but Salisbury was definitely a moment again where we just have these kind of conflicting parallel views as to the best way of doing things. Um, John McDonald himself, um, after after the attack, said that Labour front benches should stop appearing on Russia today, um, and then the Labour spokesperson in the wake of that said, "This is something which is under review, but we've not made a final decision." So, um, I think internally for the project, it was a vital moment. And, and the interesting the interesting thing, I think there's a, there's a very there's a very good quote from Andrew Murray in 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 the book, and Gabriel talks about PLP pressure and. After 2017, even Tom Watson had concluded, according to those very close to him, that sort of, you know, the show was over. It was time to, he had put up, the PLP had put up, and Corbyn had gone to the country and won uh, legitimacy in the eyes of the public. So now it was time for the PLP to shut up. And Andrew Murray uh, told us, you know, up until Salisbury, they had a, uh, in his words, a quiescent PLP. Um the polling had more or less held up since 2017. And at that point, it, you get to see the openly seditious PLP reappear. You know, you have people like Ben Bradshaw and Pat McFadden getting up on the back benches in the, and making sort of hostile interventions on their own leader in those Salisbury debates. And I suppose there's maybe, a, you know, maybe, I, I don't know what you, you would think about this, but there was a very interesting Andrew Murray, to return to Andrew Murray again, if you're looking at Labour's stances on foreign affairs, there was a strategy paper Andrew Murray wrote before the independent group split in which he said something like, um, you know, 
Mike Gapes and all of these splitters are representatives of an old-fashioned pro-NATO Atlanticist order on foreign affairs that post-Trump no longer holds. And also, as Seamus Mill successfully argued in the 2017 election, there is now a sort of isolationist mood post-Iraq in, in British, uh, in, in the, among the British public that means actually foreign interventionism isn't the flavour of the month. And you wonder whether, you know, to see the project at war over something that was so essential to Corbyn, if not Corbynism, you know, Corbyn, uh, his stance on foreign affairs is very much not a, um, very much not a reds under the bed sort of school of foreign affairs, as uh, you might put it, you know, it's um, always been sort of more pro dialogue in that, in that respect. So you wonder whether seeing that attention that fundamental at the heart of the project, um, seeing them dragged in all, in all different directions, you know, uh, something that's often said, a criticism of Corbyn from the left in this period, or, or, or Lotto or Labour in this period, is that they lost the insurgency, they lost the authenticity because they were pulled all over the place on Brexit and uh, became a parliamentary party rather than an insurgent movement. And I think that may, this may be one of those um, one of those instances when the sort of soul of Corbynism was contested very publicly. And as Gabriel says, the conflict between Lotto and McDonnell you know, um, uh, is emblematic of that in the, in this particular moment. Yeah, I think one thing that sort of establishment media in this country hasn't really come to grips with, or can't quite doesn't want to have the conversation, is that when we have you know uh, multiple terror attacks during the 2017 campaign, Jeremy Corbyn articulates a, a very unique, by the standards of British political leaders, understanding of it and a response to it, and his polling numbers go up. You might agree, you might disagree, but we, that was empirically what happened. And it, and it feels, and, I, and I, I, I personally think that's because he tapped into something within the, the broader general public, which, like you say, is nobody wants boots on the ground abroad. I mean, we, we know that just from Ed Miliband voting you know, against deployment uh, intervention in Syria before Corbyn is even leader. That in itself was a momentous kind of historical moment for an opposition to, to do that. And I do think he tapped into something. And I, I think that it was a very brave position to have at the time. And I wonder, you know, if those attacks happened in, an, in a non-electoral context, would the response have been different? Now, I'm not seeking to compare Russia to that because I think actually they made a big misstep personally on Russia. That's not to say you start, you know, start saying this was Vladimir Putin, this was ordered by the Kremlin. And I think it makes sense to sort of want to be in receipt of all the facts before you make big declarations, especially with regards to a, you know, a major power. Uh, but what I, what I think it did say to the establishment when I say the establishment, I'll, I'll be more. I'll, I'll be more succinct. You know, the the, the 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 power players, not only in the media and the Tory party, but even amongst you know ex Labour donors and so on. I think after twenty seventeen, they they thought we could take this guy seriously. Okay, he can maybe be the prime minister. He's going to have to moderate a few things. That's fine. But look, he's an older guy. He's going to need a broad project. We've still got most of the parliamentary Labour Party fundamentally. You know, they're going to hamstring anything we don't really like. There's m many checks on him, and I think what. What he did over Russia was two things. Firstly, yes, it became a problem of political management. I don't think necessarily for the electorate it was a big thing. I think it probably it probably registered, but I don't think it was a huge thing. In terms of political management for the party, it was a, it was it was a disaster. And also, I think it was signalling basically to a lot of people: look, I'm I'm really not willing to compromise one inch on a lot of things. And I, and I think you know, I think a lot of people would have said, we well, you know what, we're, we're willing to meet you halfway on, on quite a bit of this, but he, he, he wouldn't recognise that. That's by the by. What, what I think is really interesting, you both sort of mentioned there, is the John McDonnell, uh, Jeremy Corbyn Fisher. Uh, and that to me, I mean, we see this repeated in the book, I think it's really well documented, not just on the big issues like Brexit, because, you know, it was the big constitutional issue of our time, people are going to disagree, on, on the Margaret Hodge disciplinary issue, on, on a bunch of things like that. And again, entirely entitled to disagree but the fact that there were such public disagreements was quite new and the genesis of that does seem to be uh, Salisbury uh, do you think that John McDonnell in 2018 did Salisbury trigger something in him and why why did he change because obviously we're we're three years in now to the Corbyn project he's not done this unt until now I mean wh why does he start to make these increasingly public interventions at odds with the leader's office um it, it's a great question and you know, as ever in the wilderness of mirrors that is Labour, you'll get different answers depending on who you ask. Um, I mean, according to people who are close to Corbyn, um, you know, a number of people who are um, sympathetic to his stance on Salisbury, um, they say that um, 
Corbyn actually grew in confidence after the 2017 general election. Um, sure, him and John McDonnell, uh, you know, friends and comrades, and I think they had actually expressly said they didn't want to mirror the TBGBs, the the row, the rows between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown over the new Labour years. Um, and yet, you know, Corbyn did grow in confidence after that surprising election result. And um, there are some who think that John McDonnell um, basically couldn't deal with the fact that, um, you know, occasionally Corbyn would diverge from him and that ultimately what Corbyn wanted was what Corbyn got um, with, with, with respect to the party's position. Um, I mean, th that, that probably uh, is quite a kind of interpersonal analysis. Um, I think the kind of political issue at play was that the liberation struggle that you know, ultimately compelled John McDonnell was the liberation struggle, as we write, with the British working class. Um, he, he, he was a guy who was um, obsessed with power um, and you know, win, winning power in a country um, in order to uh, you know, bring, bring Britain to the left, change the way the countries run, democratise power um, and wealth. Whereas Corbyn you know, naturally always saw himself as the, uh, as the far left or the hard left, depending on what term you use. Uh, he, he saw himself as a left shadow foreign secretary um, and on issues such as foreign policy. Um, you know, for him, the notion you don't die on the hill of Russia or anti-Semitism um, would have felt quite unnatural, I think, because the whole point is that he spent his career dying on that hill. He was chair of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. He was a, you know, a, a, a torchbearer of the resistance to Iraq. Um, if the left has this moment, um, moment of power, um, moment of influence, why, why, why not say we think about foreign policy? Um, we're not here to appease the Atlanticists, um, you, you know, the people who would have voted for airstrikes in Syria, the people who did vote for Iraq. Um, whereas I think John McDonald's assessment was arguably more pragmatic. It was one of, well, listen, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can help the Palestinian people when we're in, when we're in office, but we're not going to get into office if we expend political capital and time um, on issues such as this. I mean, indeed, um, you know, after 2017, I think there was this um, th th there was this feeling that you know it's quite rare in politics you get to define the debate. And um, sure, you know, the majority of the time it's going to be the government or the media who set the terms um, of, of the discussion in the country at large. Um, what we have to do is we have to try to transcend that discussion, or we've got to move on from it quickly. Um, we're, we're not going to gain anything from being mired in the debate. Um, on Russia, and I think there was a lot of frustration because of that. I mean, I, I, I can entirely understand the sort of political analysis there. So you're saying that somebody like McDonald just wants to neutralise contentious issues of foreign policy to focus on the, on the domestic agenda. But then that doesn't necessarily explain... So, for instance, he was saying that, you know, uh, members of the Shadow Cabinet shouldn't be going on Russia today. Um, that's not, you know, that's just not his decision. That is insubordination. That's not his decision to make. If he said, it's my personal view... You know, but ultimately it's down to the, to the leader or it's a collective decision for the shadow cabinet or whatever. But he didn't say that. You know, he was often freelancing quite radical, not radical, but, you know, but ultimately it's got, you know, it's, it's regulated by Ofcom. It's allowed to broadcast in Britain. It's quite a radical thing for a, a, a British politician to say that doesn't mean anything. You know, I think if he said they, you know, their license should be reviewed or something, I mean, that's something else. So that, that in itself was quite significant. Then you've got, for instance, Margaret Hodge, uh, and, and you actually, I think it's a nice, again, another vignette where you sort of clarify what happened. It wasn't necessarily as confrontation as people depict. But, you know, him intervening there. And, I, you know, for me personally, I think it's just a disciplinary issue. I'm, the older I get, the more I realise I quite like rules. You know, otherwise, this is the problem sort of anarchist politics, as you sort of, everybody has to internalise the rulemaking all the time. And I, some of my anarchist colleagues might get upset with me at Navarro Media. But, you know, we, we have rules for a reason, because otherwise we'd all, you know, we'd all go crazy. Uh, and I... Aaron, uh, law, law and order, Bastani. Yeah, well, no, I, and I just feel like, you know, if somebody's being disciplined, you know, that's, that's a matter for the disciplinary process. And I think the more senior your position, I say, and to be fair, Keir Starmer is a sort of politician who generally, that's the kind of thing he would, he would say. He has a respect for due process. And so when I saw McDonald do that, the Campbell interview, uh, and of course the, the, the positioning on the, on the, on the second referendum, re regularly he would have Mandelson and Campbell go to his office. On the one hand, I think that's absolutely true. He was trying to neutralise the foreign policy issues. Uh, and Paul Mason says something similar. I think that's one of the things that Paul makes sense on, actually, in the, in the last couple of years. Um, Sipras did something similar. I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, but it does feel like the more you give these accounts of the relationship between Lotto and the Shadow Chancellor's office, 
it feels maybe there was a bit of jealousy there. I mean, that, that's how it strikes me. Either there was a bit of jealousy or not even necessarily jealousy. I'm the more talented politician. I know what's right, uh, rather than necessarily saying, well, I think I know what's right, but ultimately I have to defer to this guy because he is the leader. And it, it feels like McDonnell lost that towards the end, increasing over 2018, 2019. <laughs> Well, that's that's certainly what uh, people close to Jeremy Corbyn would characterise it as. That sort of, you know, John, uh, you know, there's Carrie Murphy herself has said on the record um, and says in the epilogue of the book that the coup, which we'll get onto later, that the, the putsch in Corbyn's office that Carrie Murphy later engineered, uh, no, sorry, John McDonnell engineered against Carrie Murphy and, and not quite against Seamus Milne. Carrie Murphy suspects um, was driven by John McDonnell's feeling that he couldn't. Uh, influence Corbyn as much as he felt he was entitled to. Because uh, Gable mentioned t uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown before, perhaps a better analogy here uh, is George Osborne and David Cameron, right? Corbyn and McDonnell were partners in an ideological project, just as Cameron and Osborne were. You know, people used to refer to Cameron and Osborne sort of as a joint premiership, with one person as the front man, the other as the sort of m and screens. And I'd say that's probably a fair assessment of what people in Lotto, what people very close to Corbyn, think John McDonald's perception of Corbyn and McDonald's relationship was. So as Gabriel said, and as, as, as you correctly say, as that starts to diverge, it's no wonder people like Carrie Murphy say, well, obviously this is explained by John loses control. Um, and part of, I think that's, that's also part of, partly an explanation for why you have him saying, oh, I'm going to vote Remain in this referendum or we're banning RT. Um, and frequently he'd be asked, why are you saying this when Jeremy Corbyn doesn't think it? Um, I think a good way of, you know, you can explain it one of two ways. One is that McDonnell realised that public pressure or electoral pressure would push them to that position anyway, and it would be less painful for Corbyn to make that move if he'd already broken the ground. You know, a phrase I used to use was, you know, he's like Jeremy Corbyn's navvy. He does the sort of backbreaking work of breaking the hard political ground and Corbyn sails through. Um, or I think if your people close to Corbyn think, well, he's doing that so we're hostages to fortune. We're doing that so we have to follow John McDonnell down the road. Um, and obviously, you know, we can't see into the inside of John McDonnell's head. Um, but I'd say that, that, that both of those explanations carry some weight, you would, you think. Because he's, he's, he's an extraordinarily talented politician. I think most people would agree. I mean, I, I, it's a certain in the book, and I, you know, I would certainly agree with it. That John is the most talented sort of left-wing politician of his generation. And it reminds me of there was the anecdote from Barack Obama in, I think, 2008. He said, you know, I, I would be a better speechwriter than my speechwriters. I would be a better policy advisor than my policy advisors. Um, and, and it feels like John McDonnell maybe felt that was him. Um, it's a bit like Barack Obama being a number two, running as a VP, perhaps, in 2008. I'm, I'm the one that's got the most to offer here. I guess, when do you think that became toxic because it feels like it became toxic in this kind of rivalry ultimately between McDonald's office and, and, and Corbyn's office by early 2019 was was there a particular moment where as you say this culminates in, in, in John McDonald amongst others saying we need a complete reconfiguration of the leader's office so I mean to answer that question I just want to briefly go back to the circumstances of Corbyn's uh, initial leadership victory in 2015 um, I think part of understanding John McDonnell's approach to the way that Lotto was run lies in the fact that, and you know, na naturally this won't be news to anybody that watches this channel, that you know Corbyn did not expect to win. Um, he threw his hat into the ring because Diane Abbott had done it before, John McDonnell had, does it, had done it as well. We hear a lot about the phrase, it was his turn. Um, and you know, there are some, including those close to Corbyn, who say that it wasn't incidental that Corbyn won, but, you know, naturally. Uh, McDonald, McDonald couldn't have won um, because the PLP thought he was swivel-eyed, nasty, Trotskyist, whereas Corbyn was kind of avuncular and cuddly and harmless. Um, you know, there, there are those close to Corbyn who say that nobody could have, um, you know, that no, nobody was as much of an anti-politician as him and therefore nobody could have inspired that kind of enthusiasm and sincerity from the grassroots. Um, but nevertheless, you do have this feeling that emanates from people who are close to, to McDonald who you echo the fact that, well, yeah, it was his turn, but we were we were both marginalised over the decades. Um, we've both been fighting a long, lonely fight. Um, there's nothing kind of unique or exceptional um, to Corbyn other than happen to win, but we should 
you know, jointly be the architects or kind of co co conveners of this. I mean, as you say, over time, it becomes clear that that's just not how the project is run. Um, I think probably the key point at which this becomes, you use the word toxic, is the summer of 2018, because basically, you know, McDonald took to telling people that if only they'd had one last week, if, if, if the 2017 election campaign had lasted for a seven, seven more days, uh, they could have won based on where uh, the polls were going at that time. Um, they were agonizingly close to power. They were literally talking about what Corbyn's number 10 might look like in the days running up to the poll and um, possibility of bringing an unaccompanied migrant or refugee into Corbyn's Downing Street um, or redecorating the number 10 Rose Garden. You know, they could, they could taste power. And so the summer after that, 2018, was about a big, a big summer of pushing forward making inroads into the red wall, um, extending Labour's reach in kind of cosmopolitan areas where they'd done better than expected in 2017. And what did it become about instead? They were debating the accompanying examples of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And I think that just inspired a fury um, from within. I mean, it's not just John McDonnell. A lot of people were furious that they wasted this moment. I mean, how, how can that happen? Um, you know, the, the left is in touching distance of power, and you then spend a summer, um, you know, answering questions about whether you're a Zionist or um, whether you think that Zionism and being pro-Palestine are mutually exclusive. Um, will Margaret Hodge, um be expelled or suspended or not? I mean, it was just a waste of time, and I think there was so much frustration towards Lotto because of that. And I think with Brexit, it then never really recovered. Let's stick on the IHRA. I mean, I remember speaking to many people at the time and they said, look, we just need to get all this down, we'll agree all the examples and it will be over. And I think the reason why people got, you know, why people stuck sort of to their guns um, on that was because, I, and I think they quite rightly said, I mean, I said this at the time, I said, A, it won't be over, B, it shouldn't be over because people will always, they'll always rightly, hopefully, want more complaints if this is an issue. Uh, and so I think that, that's one reading. I was, in terms of sort of political and instrumental political logic, it was clearly ridiculous. On the other hand, if you think, well, look, this isn't going to go away, that's incredibly myopic. Um, I, I can see why that would happen. I mean, for me, the big problem with IHRA was, IHRA was get a position and stick to it. Either you're going to adopt it 100%. And I thought I, I could see either making sense. Personally, at the time, I said, there's two examples I agree actually with the Labour Party. I, I just can reformulate them and other organizations have done precisely that um but stick to it and what labor did and this was something that persisted actually really across 2018 2019 was they get one position they don't hold it and then they buckle anyway and so you lose a whole a ton of political capital ultimately for nothing uh, and, and that was my sort of big concern with it i don't know what you guys think about that i think it's worth it's worth remembering actually that and we we do cover this in the book that to jenny formy's credit jenny formy was someone and, and, and lots of people um on the right of the party will disagree with this but i don't think anyone uh, particularly in the jewish community doubts or in some jewish community organizations rather doubt that jenny forby came in and sincerely wanted to tackle this problem um, and part of the problem was she proposed this new code of conduct thinking she had the backing of the jewish labor movement uh, and it turned out they sent the two people who weren't in the position to agree with the new code of conduct went to the meeting with Jenny Formby and, and thus the Pandora's box opened. Um, but I also think, sort of like you say about you know, finding a position and sticking to it, well, Corbyn had already done that over his 40 years in politics. The most fundamental position to Corbyn's politics, and if you want to bring advisors into it, in Seamus Mill's politics as well, is that they stood up for the Palestinian cause. And that was the primary you know, the, the racism they cared about, as, as much as everybody acknowledged anti-Semitism was a genuine problem in the Lottie, um, I think that, that's, that's important. You know, if we assume good faith on, on everybody's part in this narrative that, you know, nobody, and even, to, even Tony Blair as well, we quote Tony Blair as saying, Tony Blair couldn't see the point in people leaving the Labour Party over anti-Semitism because it was clear that while Labour under Corbyn's leadership had a problem with anti-Semitism in some form, to say Labour was an anti-Semitic party, that it had moved to an actively anti-Semitic position, notwithstanding the many Jewish people who were came to genuinely fear uh, existentially a, a Jewish government, uh, uh, sorry, a Labour government uh, under Jeremy Corbyn. To even Tony Blair would say, well, Labour isn't an actively anti-Semitic party or hasn't moved to an anti-Semitic anti political position. So to leave Labour for that reason is sort of absurd, is, is what Tony Blair, is what Tony Blair says. Um, 
but you know, Corbyn and people around him, like Seamus Milne, deeply cared about the Palestinian cause and, and didn't want to be seen to do something um, that enable, enabled or you know muffled uh, the rights of Palestinian people to complain about racism against them, legitimised anti-Palestinian race, inadvertently legitimised anti-Palestinian racism. So that was yeah, that that was the that was the starting point. But also, I think there was a recognition, as you say, that this necessarily wasn't the hill to die on. Um, but because that was so fundamental to a lot of people's politics, um, and Carrie Murphy again says this on the record, you know, this wasn't imposed on the party by her or even by Seamus. It was something so fundamental to Jeremy Corbyn's politics. Um, but as you say, over the course of the summer, it was so obvious Labour were going to move, one by one, the unions and the people who made up the seats on the NEC. Um, they, they fell. And then by the end of the summer, you have Len McCluskey sort of saying Jewish community leaders are guilty of truculent hostility on this towards the Labour Party, sort of fulminating an inimitable Len style. And at the end of the interview says, well, and obviously we're going to have to adopt full IHRA now because, you know, why, because that's the political wind is blowing in one direction. Um, and I think that was part, as you say, that was what was so corrosive is that it was a sort of summer of, uh, you know, pain and very public um, disputes w within and without the Labour Party where you had Jeremy Corbyn pitted against the minority community, Jeremy Corbyn arguing publicly with Benjamin Netanyahu, um, that was pulling constituent bits of the Corbynite coalition in, in different directions. But everybody sort of knew quite early on where Labour were going to end up, which was saying, in early September, we accept full IHRA. Um, and as you say, if that, if politics, uh, for better or worse, was going to demand that, I think there was a lot of frustration among some people. Why didn't we? Why didn't we start there? Because it, we don't get any credit for ending up there after being hauled over the coals publicly. But ultimately, Jeremy Corbyn had, as much as it pains a lot of people in the Labour Party and outside the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn had a consistent and coherent uh, political and philosophical case for being uneasy about that definition uh, and its examples. Well, not the definition, the examples. And indeed, as you say, you know, the, the Home Affairs Select Committee, majority Conservative MPs um, at the time, uh, and also had, had, said, had said a similar thing. You know, it's fine to, or, you know, amending the uh, examples wasn't, sort of unheard of but i think just that the way labor handled that as you say so haphazardly um meant maximize the pain um and to do it so publicly as well was not helpful and i think this sort of ties into what we were just talking about previously with regards to uh, john mcdonnell i mean john mcdonnell and um, we'll talk about this shortly in regards to the the, the attempted defenestration of uh, tom watson you know, I was talking to somebody and I said, wow, you know, I, I'm really surprised at uh, what's happened here with regards to the Tom Watson episode and, and John McDonnell. And they said, well, look, you have to understand, John is a politician, right? John is a politician. Jeremy isn't. And, and I think this, you know, to understand so much of why people are behaving in the ways that they are, the various outcomes, the various enmities, a lot of it can be just explained by that. And I think, you know, it's Jeremy Corbyn's fundamental strength and weakness was he he wasn't a politician. That's why people liked him. And that's also ultimately why he wasn't capable of, you know, providing the political management in, an, in a non-electoral context. The, the minute there wasn't an election, Jeremy Corbyn's party management just generally just kind of was was not, not great. Um, Tom Watson, uh, did Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell know about the attempts by members of the party's NEC to abolish the position of deputy leader ahead of the 2019 Labour Party conference? Um, yes. And I mean, I think to say yes is to um, elide the fact that there have been multiple attempts from within Lotto to get rid of him earlier. Um, some say that they never, they never did it because John McDonnell was happy to have Watson on side. Um, advocating a second referendum um, but by 2019 the conference it was clear there was perhaps never going to be a better opportunity um, so in terms of what actually happened um, I mean the night before the Friday of conference um, Carrie Murphy and John McDonnell had an exchange over text in which Murphy um, in short said we've got Watson's head on a block 
Um, we're, 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 we're ready to decapitate him. Um, see you tomorrow type thing. Um, and John McDonald's response, according to these texts, was to say, great, tee hee, um, exclamation mark. So um, it seems pretty clear to us that he was aware of what was happening. Um, it is quite difficult to decode where Corbyn was on the issue. He certainly knew there was this plan, but a word which a lot of people use to describe him by this stage in 2019 is that he'd become quite Delphic. Um, it was difficult to um, to establish what he did or didn't want. And there were people going into his hotel room in Brighton. Uh, there, there had been people calling him um, in a fortnight prior to conference saying, well, well, do you actually want to do this? I mean, frankly, I... It's amazing that, that that they ever did do it um, to uh, relinquish um, the opportunity of a great conference before a general election, um, you, you know, in, in order to deliver the coup de grace and get rid of Tom Watson. I mean, it seems to be, um, I think Ed Miliband said that whoever had decided to do this had taken leave of their senses. Um, I think, uh, you know, that, that that is pretty clear in retrospect. But I think Corbyn Omdenard, um he saw the appeal of getting rid of Watson and replacing him with a number of vice chairs like the Tory party has. Um, and I mean, in the end, I think, you know, literally hours before the meeting itself, he did decide, actually, let's not do this because the distraction is going to create what you know, won't be worth getting rid of Watson. Um, at which point it is said that the left on the NEC basically turned around and said, no. Um, we've been waiting our whole lives to do this. Um, you can't, you can't just click your fingers and expect that the NEC or the left NEC is do something different with moments to go. We're going to do it, um, and what we're going to do is we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get in your ear moments before we hear extraordinary motion, um, so you can leave and, you know, subsequently look down the barrel of the camera and say, "I wasn't there for what was happening. I didn't vote on it. I didn't know what was going on." Um, Mildly, farcically, I think that as Corbyn left, um, he whispered in the ear of John Landsman thanking him for a Rosh Hashanah, that is the Jewish New Year, a video that he recorded um, a few weeks earlier. And it is understood that Landsman took this as benediction for the Watson plan itself. He thought that if Jeremy's whispering thanking me for this, for this video I did, he, he must be broadly indicating that he's happy with where I am right now. Therefore, let's do it. Um, so did they know about it? Yes. Did they want it to happen? Unclear. Um, and uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the notion that they had nothing, they had nothing to do with it at all um, it, it, is ludicrous based on the fact that the people who did it say that they spoke to them before the event and had been planning on doing it for months. I mean, I, I, was, aware that, I was aware that Jeremy was kind of didn't know about it, but he, he may have known about it kind of thing. I had no idea about the the, John, the 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 claim in regards to John McDonald knowing. Um, uh, it, was, it was one of many many interesting anecdotes in the book, actually, and that wasn't the only hiccup uh, ahead of last year's Labour Party conference. You had, of course, the the leaking of um, Andrew Fisher, the chief policy advisor to, to Jeremy Corbyn. It wasn't just sort of him leaving; it was a, a very clear declaration of why he was leaving. I mean, it's remarkable, isn't it, to have these self inflicted own goals. Um, by the left ahead of a conference where you've got a Tory party. At that time, it was still, you know, it was in, in, in real disarray. You had the proroguing of parliament, although they did have a deal by this point. Uh, you've got a general election around the corner. Did, did, did people not think that these perhaps weren't the smartest of moves? I mean, it just, you know, people can talk about the media being hostile, and which I think is, is incontrovertible, but there were a lot of avoidable own goals, weren't there? Well, in one respect, yes, but I think it's important to understand motive. So, for instance, you can say IHRA was a horrific summer of a self-imposed own goal, um, and especially you know the public spats between Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. But both sides of that argument, uh, of that argument, were acting in good faith. With a politi they had a, there was a political point to the way they were behaving. They think you know, off the position I'm trying to arrive at is a net benefit to the Labour Party. It's politically useful for the Labour Party, or politically right for the Labour Party to be in this position. Um, and the same is true of the Andrew Fisher thing. So Andrew Fisher didn't write his very long and pretty uh, fiery um, fiery resignation note in which he said Labour can't win an election. Um, Lotto is a blizzard of lies and excuses, you know, based a lack of basic human decency among colleagues. 
you know, he shared that among a group of close colleagues and then said, this can't go any further. It was very swiftly deleted. Um, you know, he didn't, it wasn't for public consumption. But the reason somebody leaked that to the Sunday Times was because they wanted to take out Seamus Mill because they thought it was so transparently about Seamus Mill that they thought, well, this will really screw over Seamus and the project will be in a better place if we get rid of Seamus. So, well, I mean, for maximum, for maximum damage. Um, and obviously, maybe if you think two steps ahead, uh, maybe maybe that's a consistent theme in this book. People think, don't think two steps ahead, or maybe they're rather they're thinking three steps ahead rather than the one step ahead. Um, they think this will exert maximum damage on Seamus and make his position untenable, and that will be that. And then we'll be in a better place. You know, the the ultimate result will be uh, we're a more functional team or whatever. When actually, as you say, as you correctly identify, the net result is well, there's a load of disobliging headlines on the first morning of Jeremy Corbyn's last conference before uh, a really decisive general election in which the the story of the day is Corbynite dysfunction uh you know the most senior Corbynite the Corbyn the guy who was a Corbynite before the term was even coined um thinks Jeremy Corbyn can't win a general election rather than and obviously that's the way it's consumed politically rather than you know uh cram, you know labor lotto criminology thinking oh god you know this really you know this really throws into doubt the decision chain within lotto you know, things cannot go on, even though that was actually the, the net result. It sort of, you know, precipitated the reorganisation of Lotto in, in real money, as it were. It just made the project look completely, completely disorganised and um, dysfunctional, which it, by that stage it arguably was. How did this happen? I mean, like, you convey it really well in the book. It's just towards the end. I mean, we, you know, it was, it was obvious sort of from the outside looking in. I mean, the broader context was British politics generally was in meltdown. So, you know, just isolating on that one particular thing wasn't what we were all doing. Um, but how does that happen? How do you go from 40% of the general election, which obviously requires, anybody who gets 40% of the general election requires, you know, very good project management, uh, very good, you know, uh, coherent teams. They've got a common co kind of objective pulling together a great team ethic. How do you go from that, something so phenomenal, something so without precedent in, in recent history, I mean, it is unprecedented on, on, under a left leadership in the party, to arguably the most dysfunctional, chaotic uh, team around a senior political leader in this country, arguably ever. How, how does that happen? Where does blame lie? I think that... Um part of what Labour did in 2017 that was so brilliant was it transcended Brexit. Um, when Theresa May called that election, um, a lot of the broadcasters were relatively compliant. They characterised it in the framing on the news channels as the Brexit election. Um, what Corbyn did very effectively was he called Theresa May's bluff. He basically said, actually, you've got a parliamentary majority. You can't justify it calling this election in order to strengthen your hand in Brussels. I'm going to fight this contest on a terrain which suits me. Um, the difficulty was, was that by 2019, you, it, was, it was almost impossible to avoid uh, the, the terrain uh, of, of Brexit. And um, it, was a, you, 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 it, it was a kind of perilous issue for the party. There had been attempts for them to resolve it earlier on. Um, we've got this memo in which Andrew Murray in the wake of 2017, said, um, you know, we've got the DUP and the ERG on one side, we've got the Romaniacs on the other. Let's come through the middle, look like we're sensible, um, and put forward a kind of soft compromise Brexit that this parliament can pass. Um, Diane Abbott derided it as the Jeremy, uh, or rather the Ramsay McCorbyn plan, um, reference to Ramsay McDonald having done a deal with the Conservatives around the time of the Great Depression. Um, but basically, they didn't resolve Brexit. And so as time went on, um, you know, the personal and the political um, divides within Corbyn's office widened and kind of fueled each other. And um, yeah, it was probably a kind of correct assessment on behalf of John McDonnell that it wasn't going to be possible to go into a general election without having attempted to resolve the, uh, the, the divide over Brexit. Um, probably the the greatest mishap is the fact that he decided to intervene so late. I mean, to be doing this, um, you know, in, in, a, in a run up to a party conference with, uh, you know, we, we knew there would be a general election in September, October, your know, latest December um, was, you know, was probably kind of criminal 
um, mismanagement. And I, I mean, I'm not, not not pointing the finger at John McDonald personally. I mean, a lot of people within Lotto would have to have to do some solemn solemn retrospection uh, introspection as well. I mean, the person that leaked that Andrew Fisher resignation note, they summoned the political editor of the Sunday Times for a uh, furtive brush by and a coster in Westminster in order to give them this letter um, so that it would you know, cause the greatest combustion possible um, at, at this all-important party conference. And you know, th- this reckoning was probably inevitable, but it just happened way, way too late. Um, and the personal and political had festered so much by that point that it's quite hard to imagine the general election I mean, which Labour could have once again transcended Brexit and summoned the kind of levity and optimism of two years previously. So you think it was undoubtedly the sort of broader political context which explains the, the difference in in outcomes? Because uh, what, again, what comes through the book, and I think uh, Paul says it uh, towards the end, is that ultimately Jeremy Corbyn has to take responsibility for the result. And I, I would agree with that absolutely 100%. Um, if that probably hasn't come through what we've, what we've said so far, that's, that's also what I think. Uh, and what comes across in the book is uh, Jeremy Corbyn's just inability sometimes to make quite hard decisions. Um, and very frequently that's outsourced to Carrie Murphy, for instance. And so she comes in for a bit of a, you know, she, she'll get attacked or denigrated by other people. But it's almost, at times it's almost pathological, the, the, the inability to make quite tough decisions. I mean, you talk about, for instance, his private secretary, and this amazing episode, I haven't put this in the notes, but I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a really interesting kind of anecdote about his private secretary. She, she seems to think she's basically got an executive director role. She's like a personal advisor. Uh, and she, she accompanies him to meet the head of MI5, is it? Was it five oh, or I, six? I it was both. Okay, yeah. Oh, but the interesting, the interesting thing, the, the root of the root of that uh, that feeling of sort of defiance towards the Lotto order was precisely because there was a feeling of resentment within Lotto that um, Carrie Murphy had taken too much power. But as you correctly identify, the reason Carrie Murphy ultimately was so powerful was because there was a vacuum where quick executive decision making was meant to be. I mean, people close to Jeremy Corbyn recall that in the wake of the twenty seventeen results. Uh, the people close to him started going to training sessions at the Institute for Government because Labour was so close to get, getting re- to forming a government or you know, Theresa May could have formed at any time. So the conventional wisdom went then. Um, they needed to get ready for the business of running the country. So Jeremy Corbyn was provided, um, I can't remember whether this is in the book, but Jeremy Corbyn was provided with a sort of a mock red box and said part of being prime minister is you have to make 20 decisions sort of before breakfast. So practice this. And... Close aides tried to practice it with Jeremy, and you know he and people say to his credit, you know he's a peaceable, uh, very kind man who loathes confrontation, um, and frankly, in this period, was a bit of a ditherer. So finally, he struggled to even do the sort of mock exercise of 20, uh, 20 mock decisions a day. And as you, as you say, you know over time, the political context becomes so much more febrile. And it also tears apart the project at the at its core. People are being dragged in opposite directions on Brexit and much else besides. And it's important to remember how close knit this group of people was. The, when the when the coup, the chicken coup, as, as people remember it, uh, the PLP coup twenty sixteen was raging. The decision to fight on was taken at Unites HQ, and only seven people were in that meeting. That was how cl- that was how small the nucleus of this project was. And over time because of Brexit, it, that, even that small group was being torn apart. Um, and obviously at the centre of this, Jeremy Corbyn, the only man binding it all together, already pathologically averse to confrontation, didn't like disappointing friends, um, was prone to tell people, according to those who spoke to him or tried to influence him in this period, you know, prone to giving people the impression that he had agreed to their impassioned uh, appeal for something or other, when really he'd done no such thing. Of course, that was going to exert more tension on Jeremy Corbyn. It exert more tension on any political leader. But for a political leader who already didn't like th- th- this aspect of leadership, it was always going to be disastrous. Yeah, I think that's that's the big takeaway from me. Speaking of leaders, when did Keir Starmer decide that he wanted to replace Jeremy Corbyn, do you think, as Labour Party leader? I think that he there was this point where you start seeing Keir Starmer... Um, you know, in his suit, but nevertheless in the streets, um, there was this People's Vote rally in Parliament Square um, where he spoke alongside John McDonnell and Diane Abbott. Um, and I think, you know, for many people that kind of crystallised the fact that Keir Starmer was, was on manoeuvres. Um, 
because he's you know former DPP um, besuited former barrister, not the kind of guy that typically um, is pounding the pavements with campaign group MPs. Um, I think probably a, a vital turning point was that conference of 2018. Um, it is disputed whether he always knew he was going to say um, ruling out Remain on the ballot paper or whether he said it because Len McCloskey had seemingly defied what had been agreed the night before. But, I mean, a lot, a lot of people kind of trace, trace Starmer's leadership back to this moment where um, he says before Labour conference, um, you know, no, nobody's rooting out Remain on the ballot paper in the event of a second referendum. And by all accounts, you know, his team was shocked by the fact that he elicited this standing ovation. Um, and in that moment, I think a lot of people, you, you know, around Starmer thought, well, w- wow, I mean, who, who, who else could do that? Who, who else would have the, uh, you know, the authority to do that? Who has a position on Brexit that would enable them to say and get away with that? Um, I, I think, frankly, there just wasn't that much planning on the left um, for you know, the eventual succession um, because so much time and resources have been dedicated to merely preserving Corbyn's own leadership. Um, and so certainly, you know, beyond 2018, um, I think there are a lot of other people that wanted Starmer to run. And uh, we, do, we, do, you know, we do reveal in the book that um, Paul Mason kind of um, you know, did put forward this idea in the summer of 2019, that Keir Starmer might need to lead an interim government of national unity. Um, and, uh, you know, he did, Starmer himself did spend a lot of time in the 2019 general election campaign, um, marginalised. Um, he, you know, he wasn't asked to do big events with Corbyn. Um, his team grumbled that um, he, he was basically told to be quiet and stay in London. Um, and so he did. He just banned his leadership campaign in the meantime. Um, so a, a lot of time was spent gathering at the house of Tom Kibassi um, of the IPPR think tank. Um, Paul Mason was there a lot of the time as well. And they were together kind of answering some of the big questions as to what was needed to, to win a campaign. What was interesting for me is that, and this is why I'm worried that Keir Starmer isn't actually that interested in, in power. And people might be sort of, oh, that's a bit of a strange thing to say. Is I always, I've always been hugely impressed by Tom Kibassi. Um, I mean, he's been on the Vara Media. I thought he had a very good position on Brexit, the idea of the shared market and so on, not the single market. And he was never offered a job. Um, and I find this interesting. You talk about it in the book. It's towards the end. I think I tweeted about it a couple of weeks ago. You know, Laura Parker, Tom Kibassi, Paul Mason, these kind of left figures. At this point, Laura Parker is still the head of Momentum, remarkably, uh, assisting um, uh, Keir Starmer in, in advance of him launching this uh, leadership bid. Yet none of them have jobs with Keir Starmer. And I, I, I find this particularly interesting. Kat Fletcher is another one as well. I don't think she's inside the tent anymore. And so what does this tell us? Well, firstly, firstly, I feel like those characters have possibly been used by Keir Starmer. That's obviously not for me to decide, but that's how it appears. But in the, in the case of Tom Kibassi, you think he's a hugely impressive guy. You know, he's, uh, he's been at McKinsey, so the Labour right and all that, 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 that kind of that milieu of people are going to naturally like him. And yet he's not offered a position. And I feel like it's perhaps because he's actually a threat. Um, so I, I throw this back over to you, I guess. Why, why would another people that you've talked about as kind of coming from the left, helping Starmer become the leader, why were none of them offered positions? Well, so that's the million dollar question. And I think it gets to the core of what was, you know, what was Keir Starmer's leadership campaign for? Who was it for? Um, and obviously a, a character we analyse in some depth is the man who's now Keir Starmer's chief of staff, Morgan McSweeney, who ran a very different leadership campaign in 2015. Um, Liz Kendall's, um, and then spent the ensuing years heading up Labour together, trying to work out a sort of language in which you could speak to an overwhelmingly Corbynite membership um, about the, the values every Labour Party member shares, or most Labour Party member shares, regardless of their views on PFI or rail franchising or foreign intervention. You know, the McSweeney thesis is that actually Labour members think in broad-based values. And that was the sort of language Keir Starmer thought. But I think a phrase we use is, you know, to McSweeney, the point of that campaign was to marginalise Corbyn, Corbynism without Corbynite members knowing it uh, or without sort of anti-austerity Corbynite membership thinking it. And obviously, um, if you look at the Labour Together election post-mortem, uh, it does say retain the economic radicalism. Um, not that we've seen very much of that from Keir Starmer. Um, but I think there is definitely, and I, I, I think you know Gabriel might agree with this, that I think among people who were around the Starmer campaign but didn't necessarily end up in the 
in the uh, in the leader of the opposition's office, there is a degree of resentment about the way the cards fell in the end. But I mean, there is also, to a certain extent, what did what did people expect from uh, a leadership campaign run by run by Morgan McSweeney, uh, who is uh, by on the evidence of this mandate an incredibly talented guy, but he's not of the left of the Labour Party, even if he believes that. Um, you know, there's a broad base of Labour members who broadly agree with the same thing, regardless of whether they voted for Corbyn in 2015 or whether they voted for David Miliband in 2010, or indeed whether they actually weren't in the Labour Party um, until 2017. Um, so the short answer is, it's almost too early to tell. Um, but to say it was a campaign by the left for the left, obviously there was a significant uh, Corbynite left input into this campaign, um, would, would be a misnomer. I mean, and it was very effective that it looked like, in many ways, the continuity campaign, right? There were two kinds of continuity in this election. There was institutional continuity as re represented by the RLB campaign and almost sort of, uh, not necessarily ideological continuity, but sort of, you know, uh, Keir was carrying forward the 2015-2017 the agenda and, you know, RLB was the, was the candidate of the project, as it were. Um, but yeah. I mean, I was just also going to say, um, just to... On a on a very personal level, address your question. Um, I know that a lot of the people are surprised and mighty fucked off about the fact that they've not been offered jobs. Um, Peter Mandelson very memorably said to us, um, "Whoever created Morgan McSweeney deserves their place in heaven," um, which um, you know, might might tell you a little bit about um, McSweeney's own kind of political heritage. And uh, you know, as Patrick said, he spent. Um, a lot of the time between 2015 and 2019 thinking very hard um, about how to build a vehicle, um, you, you know, to succeed Corbyn um, and, you know, bring the party back towards what he would regard as kind of sensible um, centre-left democratic socialism. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people feel like they've had the wool pulled over their eyes. Um, I don't know whether this is a little scooplet for Navarra Media. Um, I do gather my, 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 my people in Lotto do say that Kat Fletcher, who worked on both of Corbyn's leadership campaigns, um, m may soon be returning to Southside. Um, but yeah, Laura Parker, National Organiser of Momentum, Tonki Bassi from IPPR are, are nowhere to be seen. Um, and that, that's super interesting. Um, and it does pose a question as to who, who the campaign was for. It was certainly by um, a lot of pretty serious people on the left. Yeah, I think I think the the best way to understand Stom, I think he did a fantastic job. Like he says, continuity Corbynism. I'm, it's Corbynism in 2017, but I can win, right? And I'm going to neutralise all these attack lines. And a lot of people bought that, and it's a very compelling message. Then on the other hand, you've got Rebecca Long Bailey. I just want to finish with Rebecca Long Bailey, really. Why was that campaign so bad? I mean, ultimately, she got less than 30 percent of the vote. She wasn't a particularly bad candidate. Um, you know, she's. She's, you know, she's the only politician really who's taken Rishi Sunak to task in the last couple of years. She's a relatively good public speaker. She's got good policy chops on her and so on. Uh, she had credibility when it came to, to the Green New Deal, for instance. Why was that campaign so bad compared to the runaway success of the Keir Starmer campaign, do you think? I mean, bluntly, because it didn't exist for two weeks after Jeremy Corbyn lost the election, at least two weeks after Jeremy Corbyn lost the election. You know, people who worked on that came campaign recall turning up sort of well after Keir Starmer has started motoring and there's no logo, there's no slogan, there's no sense of what they're going to do and where, you know, early on aides walk out over the perceived, um, you know, the perceived uh, excessive control John Landsman had over the operation. But I mean, bluntly, it was just a lack of organisation, a lack of succession planning, right? Keir Starmer is looking at spreadsheets and pouring over PowerPoints, talking about, you know, which segments of the membership think what, and, you know, here's the 5% that still think a rat was a great idea. You know, you're not going to win them. Here's the chunk you're going to win. Whereas, you know, Long Bailey, um, as, as is only human after a grueling election campaign that's been personally and politically painful, um, went on holiday after the election. That's not to say, you know, Long Bailey was wrong to do that. It's a testament to the fact that the left weren't necessarily... Um, you know, didn't have a plan nailed on, that their, the woman who was obviously spoken of as their uh, successor designate for the whole of the 2017 parliament is on holiday when Keir Starmer is really, is already hiring people and, um, you know, has a fully functioning campaign. And then obviously you have the public will he, won't he, Ian Lavery, uh, Ian Lavery episode. And then 
I mean, I mean, this this represented the extent to which there was the the project, the Corbyn project, had sort of fractured and was unclear on what it wanted from the moment, let alone the future. You have the bizarre Barry Gardner two days where Barry Gardner is pondering aloud the fact whether Len McCluskey wants him to run. Obviously, Barry, Barry Gardner insists at the time that. Uh, you know, sources close to Barry Gardner briefed that Len McCluskey had asked Barry Gardner to run. Both Barry Gardner and Len McCluskey denied that. But the very fact that this conversation was happening in public betrayed the fact there had been no thorough succession planning. Um, and that, bluntly, is a big part of the reason why, because Keir Starmer had already got out there with his video of a Yorkshire miner, with a video of him talking about being on the picket line at Wapping. Keir Starmer had detoxified himself taking on all the arguments about himself, you know, uh, Brexit, he said, let's get Brexit done, essentially said, you know, yes, I'm a very wealthy lawyer, but here are all the progressive causes I work for. Um, all the while, Becky Long Bailey w was nowhere to be seen. From, through no fault of her own, if the project had been serious about winning the succession, they should have had a plan. And people who worked on that campaign say there was no plan. We're going to end it there, chaps. I mean, it's uh, it's a fantastic book. I mean, it's important to say as well uh, because you came under some heat for Oatcake Gate. Uh, it's a it's a first draft, and they actually, I think you you put it very well at the beginning of the book. Uh, this is the first draft of history, a bit like the the, the the Tim Shipman books in relation to the Tories in the context of Brexit. It's very good. It's very readable. Uh, I would recommend it to anybody who wants to know more about the last three years in particular in regards to the internal political machinations of the Labour Party. Uh, is there anything else you chaps would like to say before we uh, let you get on with the rest of the day? Where can people find you on Twitter? What are your handles? And what is the oh, next I'm project? At, I'm at Patrick K. Maguire. Um, people ask us whether we want to write a Starmer book next. Uh, I don't think there's... It's to Keir Starmer's credit. It's a, it's a testament to his current political strategy that I don't think either of us would know where to start on the inner life of the Starmer leadership because they're betraying so little. Uh so maybe give us a couple of years and we'll work on that. But we've got a we've got a paperback of this book to to uh, get our teeth into. So you know all you know all additional colour on the period gratefully received uh, testimonies. If people want to challenge the recollections of others, please do. We've got a paperback to got a paperback to write. Um, we we did this uh, Romaniacs podcast the other day, and they asked us whether there were any causes that we wanted to give a shout out to. I think virtuous guests on the podcast you're yeah, allowed to say this is my favorite charity um probably doesn't flatter me or patrick that we are such uh amoral reporters reporters that we sort of uh, we, we we sort of said you know what we'll, we'll, we'll let other people promote particular charities today too um but i think what you know it, what i'm trying to say is that you know we we try to um approach this but from from that perspective of being kind of reporters reporters we weren't necessarily trying to take anybody's side or make a wider moral point i, d I don't think either of us necessarily have particularly big politics as it were um and so uh you know it's lovely lo lovely that you recognize that um we've tried to do it in an even-handed way um and um you know I'd, we, we we welcome uh thoughts uh criticism um leaked whatsapps uh, and anything else that the navara audience would like to send our way um, so no, thank you so much for having us on. My pleasure. Thank uh, you. It's, it's critical that we get the, the historical record uh, depicting the fact that uh, reality is often far stranger than fiction. Uh, good luck with the paperback and thanks for joining us on Navarro thank Media. You.